1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now, concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, peace and safety, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin and there will be no escape. But you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. For you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to darkness and night. So be on your guard. Not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. And I also want to read to you 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 20. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. Hi, my name is Cynthia, and I'm a child of God. And I'm here to share with you the gospel, which is the good news. Now... We have a lot to cover. Um, today, I want to talk about, I want to read the scriptures, and then we're going to talk about the rapture, the pre-tribulation rapture, and um, the most important, uh, the most important thing that anyone can be telling, can be doing right now, children of God, is sharing the gospel. Nothing is more important today. Um, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. God is holy, without sin, and righteous. He is just, for, for the Lord our God is holy. Psalms 99, verse 9. We are all sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 We all deserve death and separation from God due to our sins. Romans 6.23 tells us, for the wages of sin is death. Uh, but the good news tells us that God loves us even though we are sinners. God has given his only begotten son in order to pay for our sins. Jesus Christ died in our place and rose from death. 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4 says, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Heaven is a free gift for sinners. We receive this gift only by faith and only through Christ. It is not a reward for those who do good things or your good works, your good deeds. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 tells us, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God promises us that whoever believes only in his son, Jesus Christ, for salvation can know with absolute certainty they have eternal life first john 5 11 through 13 says and this is the testimony that god has given us eternal life and this life is in his son he who has the son has life he who does not have the son of god does not have life 
These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. God promises us that we can never lose our salvation. God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, are who keep us saved. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Would you accept the fact that you deserve judgment, you deserve hell, since that is God's judgment? But at the same time, God loves us in such a way that he has given his son to die on the cross in our place. Jesus Christ paid for all of our sins. So by simply believing in him instead of our good works, by trusting in him and putting your faith in him and him alone, we can be saved. If you trust in Jesus Christ alone to obtain the gift of salvation, God guarantees that you are eternally secure in him and that you will be with him forever in heaven. Now, there's a lot of people who say, that prodigals are not saved. Um, they, we got a lot of fruit readers out there. Um, they think they're, you know, they look at someone and they think that they know their heart based on what they're doing in their lives. But I'm sorry, Christians, once you're saved, you're saved. Once you're truly saved. And let's say you go off on your own, you know, you, you come to Jesus, you are truly saved and you go off on your own journey and you leave for a while, and you go out and do a bunch of dumb, stupid things, Jesus will come find you. He will bring you back, and you, you, he will not lose, not even one. Um, Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7, tells us the story of the prodigal, and of the prodigal son, and how Jesus, or the Father, God the Father, will make sure that you are brought back into the fold if you are lost. And he does this. So Luke 15, 1 through 7, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner's sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and has strayed away. Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 31. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man has two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. And he began to starve. He, per uh, he persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came back to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, father, I have sinned. 
against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. God will forgive you. Jesus will forgive you. How many times? Well, I believe that Jesus told Peter he would forgive seven, he must forgive 70 times 70, which means he is merciful till the end. He will always forgive you. Many people like to use one of the verses um, that says that, um, that if you continue willfully sinning, you um, confuse and you, you, you just continuously sin, the same sins over and over again willfully, that there is no longer any redemption left for you. Um, a lot of people like to use that to say, hey, if you sin after you've been saved, you are going to um, lose your salvation. But the truth is, and this is the truth, these are people who are not truly saved, who enjoy their sins. Um, who do not repent, who believe that they are just fine living the way they are, um, they're not truly saved because no true Christian enjoys their sin. No true Christian wants to sin. But we are of the flesh and we have not been glorified. We are not like Christ yet. And he continues to work through us and he will, he will, keep his promises and someday when we have our glorified bodies we will be free from sin but while we're down here living in our flesh we will struggle against the flesh even Paul struggled with sin he said that he did things that he didn't want to do and the things that he wanted to do he didn't do and this was a great um, thorn in his side but Jesus will continue to work through us, and he is not going to lose us. We are kept secure in the palm of his hand. He will not lose even one. There is so much happening in the world today. I mean, watchmen stay on the wall. It's, we're getting closer and closer to the rapture of the church. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be next month. Or we might be leaving in the spring at Passover. All of that is good to me. Sounds great to me. Um, but the things that are happening in the world today, there's no doubt 
Jesus is coming very soon. And I'm hoping for tonight. But he could come this Christmas. We don't know when he's coming. That's true. But we are told to be sober and to watch. I, I don't know how many of my viewers are. I have 236 of you um, subscribed to my channel. And I don't know how many of you are are subscribed to other watchmen or who even how many of you even know what's happening out there in the world. Um, but very recently, in, um, the Turkey MP was giving a speech at Parliament in which he said that Israel will face the wrath of Allah. And seconds later, he fell over. He had a heart attack. This is witnessed by everyone. He had a heart attack, and I believe he was in the hospital for a day or two before he died. Um, mocking God is never a good idea. Never a good idea. Because Allah is not God. God, the creator of the universe, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of David, God our Father, that's God. And he, um, he chose Israel, and he's not done with them. And anyone who curses Israel will be cursed, as this Turkey MP found out. Um, I know it seems like we should be gloating and happy that this happened. Yes, it's a, this is a great witness to the world that this is what happens when you mock God. Um, to give a speech in Parliament and say that Allah, that Israel will face the wrath of Allah. Um, this is a great um, witness to the world to say this and then seconds later be struck down just like that because the God of Israel is tr the true God. But this man is now spending his first nights, first week in hell. And that's not something I'd wish on anyone. It's too late for him. But it's not too late for us. <sighs> Interestingly, Hamas, who so many people are supporting, the Muslims are supporting Hamas, and they just fired a missile at the Dome of the Rock. That's huge. Um, we know that the Third Temple is going to be built. And for that to happen, the Dome of the Rock is probably going to have to be destroyed huge. Um, the very fact that they are actually, they actually fired missiles at the Dome of the Rock, or at least one, one or two missiles were headed for the Dome of the Rock, and is it the Israel defense, um, they did defend it, and they shot, their, their Iron Dome shot down the missile that would have hit the mosque. Yeah. That's who Muslims support this terrorist group who doesn't even care about their most holiest site. <sighs> hmm. We've got COP28 um, COP um, being signed for the seven years. I'm not sure if they've signed it yet. Um, I do know that they plan to implement. They want to start the, to implement it starting January 1st. We very well could be gone before then. And interesting, I'm hearing rumors that um, Israel wants to sacrifice the heifers the red heifers in January. There's a lot happening in the world. There's a lot happening in the world and we cannot ignore it. You see AI, we see the rise of AI. We see the technology, we see the, the deep fake. These things are the beast system, cashless society coming very soon. They don't want you driving cars. They don't want you eating food. Uh, Lab-grown meat is hitting the grocery stores. Not um, Now, I haven't found it in my grocery store yet that I'm aware of, thank goodness, because I'm not going to buy it, and I'm not eating their lab-grown um, gross. Um, but <clears throat> I was in the grocery shop, um, grocery store shopping just yesterday, and I could hear people grumbling, um, going walking through the aisles, uh, there was a, there was one woman who said, how do they expect us to eat and live? Well, they don't. That's the truth. They don't expect us to eat and live. They're trying, they, they want us gone. 
they they're they don't have good plans for us um the elite the rich people that everyone's listening to the rich people um thinking that they're going to save us the politicians the millionaires but they're not only jesus can save us now so i live in minnesota northern minnesota um we should have a lot of snow right now lots of snow my um backyard should look like the background behind me this is minnesota i'm only two hours away from the canadian border i'm pretty north um but we just had over 20 like 24 hours of rain it's been raining and uh some of it did free i mean it froze it got a little bit colder last night so it's actually frozen but we i went through like an all night and then all day and then all night until like four in the morning three in the morning and then it started finally snowing and um when i got up today and looked outside it's basically just ice outside i we don't have snow we have ice uh, because it, the temperatures dropped and all of that rain is frozen. This is Minnesota. It is Christmas next week. Uh, Christmas is coming up next weekend. And there's no snow. So I had somebody tell me, wow, this is really bad. This is not, you know, this is, this is bad. This is not okay. We're, um... And I said, yeah, I know. The tribulation's coming. And of course, I'm told, Ugh, I don't want to hear about your fantasies. It's climate. I said, no, this isn't climate. This is what the Bible told us was going to happen. This is God. They're trying to call it El Nino. Um, they're saying that it's El Nino is, you know, a warm front coming through. The, the currents have shifted in the Atlantic Pacific, and now they're going... Instead of going east to west, they're going west to east, and it's pushing these warm waters from the Atlantic up um, on the shores, which makes everything warmer. Um, and it's all being called El Nino, which is, you know, it it affects people globally. It affects everyone, makes some areas drier, some areas wetter. People who would normally be getting snow will be getting rain. Um, you can call it what you want. I don't care. Um, if the Bible told us this is what was going to happen, this is what it was going to be like in the last days, and it's God controls the weather. Nobody else controls the weather. This isn't a, a, just the warming of an ocean coming our way and that, you know, the temperatures have dropped. That's God that's doing that. He controls the weather. And no matter what you call it, the Bible was clear this is what it would be like in the end days. The weather is crazy changing and we know Christians know we're watching the signs we were told to watch for this we were told to watch for this and we are we're seeing the tribulation coming a seven year tribulation all lined up let's look at um, Hebrews chapter 11 um, because we need to remember to and be encouraged that our faith is not in vain. Our faith, no one, no one who puts their faith in Jesus will be disappointed. Um, and I just want to encourage you. Um, chapter 11 is some great examples of faith. And yes, we are going to talk about the rapture towards the end. I will really get into that. But like I said, I would like to share some scriptures with y'all first. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in the days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe, the entire universe was formed at God's command, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. It was by faith 
that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man. And God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received righteousness that comes by faith. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going, and when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents, and so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child. Though she was barren and was too old, she believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead, a nation with so many people that, like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, there is no way to count them. All these people died, still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on the earth. Obviously, People who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac, Isaac is the son through, through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. It was by faith that Isaac promised blessings for the future to his sons, Jacob and Esau. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. It was by faith that Joseph, when he was about to die, said confidently that the people of Israel would leave Egypt. He even commanded them to take his bones with them when they left. It was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born, they saw that God had given them an unusual child. And they were not afraid to um, disobey the king's command. Um, it was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying his fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover and to sprinkle blood on the doorposts so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn sons. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were all drowned. It was by faith 
that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. It was by faith that Rahab, the prostitute, was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome, welcome to the spies. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, J David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back from the dead. Just give me one second here. Okay. But others were tortured. Refusing to turn from God in order to be set free, they placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half, and others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people, earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd, a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured on the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is sit seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. And that was, um, I continued through, chap I read chap Hebrews chapter 11, and I continued from Hebrews chapter 12 through 8. Yeah through eight. Brothers and sisters, we must stand strong in our faith. We must keep watching. Yes, it's hard. We're in the last days. We were put here to be a witness to the things that we're seeing today so that we can tell others. I had, um, I've seen someone ask, why should we be watching, um, even talking about the Antichrist or even trying to guess who he is or even looking at those scriptures at all about the Antichrist to come during the Great Tribulation, the one who will set up the abomination of desolation, the one who will declare himself God. We're not going to be here for that. We're leaving. Some of you are here just um, came to my video because you want to hear about the rapture. Um, we're living in the last days. We have to keep oil in our lamp. 
We have to be faithful. We have to be we have to be watching. We have to be ready to go because we truly are leaving soon. Um, but while we're here, we need to be a light to the world. It's getting dark out there. The darkness is um, spreading. There's true evil happening in the world today. And most of us thought we'd be gone and we wouldn't be seeing these things that are occurring on the earth. However, there's a reason we're here. And that is to lead others, to point them to Jesus, to tell them what's really happening in the world. We're planting those seeds. And once we are gone, many will remember what we have said, what we have taught. They will look for the truth. They will know because we told them before we left. They'll know what to look out for. And when they see, those, see the rapture happen, many will come. Jerusalem, uh, Israel will be redeemed because we've told them, the scriptures have told them, they're going to they're gonna accept Jesus as their Messiah. Many will be saved during the tribulation, but it's going to be a terrible, terrible time. But there's still hope for our loved ones, the ones who are scoffing today. There's hope for them that they will turn to God, that they will turn to Jesus and accept him. Once we're gone and they see the proof, those of us who believe without seeing, we're the ones who are blessed. But many will make it um, to the end. They're not Christians today, but they've heard the word. Um, and they're going to know. Most won't. Most aren't going to come to him. But while we are here as Christians, we are here as a witness to the things that are happening. We are here to tell the world it's not climate. It's not El Nino. It's not a natural cycle. The world is not going to continue to go on. It's not going to get better. And the government will not save you. That's what our job is right now. While we're waiting and watching for the return of Jesus, we need to be sharing as hard as that is. And it's hard. I know. We are being scoffed and mocked at all the time. I know. But no one who puts their faith in Jesus will be disappointed. He's coming. We're going to look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 through chapter 3. And then we're going to move on and I'm going to discuss with you the rapture in a way that I haven't before. And I, um, I believe that this will be very enlightening for some who don't understand how the rapture could even be a part of the gospel, but we're going to get to that. So second Peter chapter two, verse four through chapter three. And I'll probably stop at um, verse 16 of chapter 3. Or who knows? Maybe we'll just, we'll just read it all. There's only a couple more verses after that. So, actually, I actually think I'm just going to read all of chapter 2 and chapter 3. Because it's all relevant. Don't let the mockers and scoffers get to you. We know the truth. The Holy Spirit lives in us. We're leaving soon, and we really should pity them. The ones who are going to be left are going to be, sadly, they'll be beheaded, or they'll take the mark, and they're eternally damned. It is up to them. We can only plant the seeds. God will water it and make water them and make them grow. So chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2 and chapter 3. The dangers of false teachers. But there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who brought them in this way. They will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, 
the way of truth will be slandered. In, the, in their greed, they will make up clever lies to get a hold of your money. But God condemned them long ago, and their destruction will not be delayed. For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell, in gloomy pits of darkness, where they are being held until the day of judgment. And God did not spare the ancient world, except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the word of Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment, so God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ash. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. But God also rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a righteous man who was sick of the shameful immorality of the wicked people around him. Yes, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness he saw and heard day after day. So you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the day of final judgment. He is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire and who despise authority. These people are proud and arrogant, daring even to scoff at supernatural beings without so much as trembling. But the angels, who are far greater in power and strength, do not dare to bring, um, do not dare to bring from the Lord a charge of blasphemy against these supernatural beings. These false teachers are like unthinking animals, creatures of instinct born to be caught and destroyed. They scoff at things they do not understand, and like animals, they will be destroyed. Their destruction is their, re their reward for the harm they have done. They love to indulge in evil pleasures in broad daylight. They are a disgrace and a stain among you. They delight in deception, even as they eat with you in your fellowship meals. They commit adultery with their eyes, and their desire for sin is never satisfied. They lure unstable people into sin, and they are well trained in greed. They live under God's curse. They have wandered off the right road and followed the footsteps, the footsteps of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved to earn money by doing wrong. But Balaam was stopped from his mad course when his donkey rebuked him with a human voice. These people are as useless as dried up springs or as a mist blown away by the wind. They are doomed to blackest darkness. They brag about themselves with empty foolish boasting. With an appeal to twisted sexual desires, they lure back into sin those who have barely escaped from a lifestyle of deception. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption. For you are a slave to whatever controls you. And when people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and then get tangled up and enslaved by sin again, <coughs> they are wor worse off than before. It would be better if they had never known the way to righteousness than to know it and then reject the command they were given to live a holy life. They prove the truth of this proverb, a dog returns to its vomit. And another says, a washed pig returns to the mud. Chapter 3. The day of the Lord is coming. This is my second letter to you, dear friends. And in both of them, I have tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember what the Holy Prophet said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. This is Peter. He lived with Jesus. He walked with Jesus. He gave his life for Jesus. One of my favorite apostles, next to Paul and John. But most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened 
to the promise that Jesus is coming again. From before the time of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. How many times have you heard this today? In the world right now, this is what they're saying. It's like their mantra. You've been saying this forever. When's he coming? He's not coming. This is their mantra. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command. And he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when the ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along on that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth. He has promised a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him. Speaking of these things, in all of his letters, some of his comments are hard to understand, and those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted his letters to mean something quite different, just as they do with other parts of Scripture, and this will result in their destruction. You already know these things, dear friends, so be on guard. Then you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All glory to him, both now and forever. Amen. You know, the book of Peter, Second Peter, it's one of those smaller books. It's not... Um, It's some of these books are very small and they give us such great insight into God, what he wants from us, what we should be doing, what we should be expecting. And the word of God is alive today. Read it. Don't just... Don't just listen to what people are saying. There is great deception in the world today, and there is a lot of scoffers and mockers. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 20 through 33 say, Wisdom shouts in the street. She cries out in the public square. She calls to the crowds along the main street, to those gathered in front of the city gate. How long, you simpletons? Will you insist on being simple-minded? How long will you mockers relish in your mocking? How long will you fools hate knowledge? Come and listen to my counsel. I'll share my heart with you and make you wise. I called you so often, but you wouldn't come. I reached out to you, but you paid no attention. You ignored my advice and rejected the correction I offered. So I will laugh. When you are in trouble, I will mock you when disaster overtakes you, when calamity overtakes you like a storm, 
when disaster engulfs you like a cyclone and anguish and distress overwhelm you. When they cry for help, I will not answer. Though they anxiously search for me, they will not find me. For they hated knowledge and chose not to fear the Lord. They rejected my advice and paid no attention when I corrected them. Therefore, they must eat the bitter fruit of living their own way, choking on their own schemes. For simpletons turn away from me to death. Fools are destroyed by their, by their complacency. But all who listen to me will live in complete peace, untroubled by fear of harm. Revelation chapter 3, verse 3. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. This is, if you do not watch, you will not know. But we are watching and we are not going to be taken by surprise. Listen to that again. Revelation chapter 3, verse 3. And this is before Revelation chapter 4, 1, which is the when the rapture occurs in John's vision, when he is called up, come up hither. That's the rapture of the church. And he finds the seven lampstands before the throne. What are the seven lampstands? They're the seven churches. Revelation chapter 3, verse 3. Listen to this again. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Matthew twenty four forty two says, Watch, therefore, you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18, Paul says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means proceed or go before those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead will rise and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, Paul includes himself, who are alive and remain shall be caught up. There's our word harpazo or raptured together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Then Paul closes with, therefore comfort one another with these words. In second Peter chapter three, verse three through four, Paul says, scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep or literally died, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So they were saying, there's no coming again of the Lord. It hasn't happened yet. It won't happen in the future. They were mocking the concept or the doctrine of the return of Jesus Christ. They will all, there will also be mockers and scoffers in the last days. And those mockers have arrived. As Christians, we believe in the incarnation that God became a man in Christ. We believe in the crucifixion, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We believe in the resurrection, that Jesus rose victoriously and bodily from the grave. We believe in the ascension, that Christ ascended back into heaven, and we believe in the exaltation, that Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father. But that's not the end of the story. We also believe in the return of Jesus Christ. He is coming again. We focus so much on his birth and on his death and on his resurrection, but we forget that he ascended. He is ascended, exalted, and will come again. Jesus promised to come, to come again. 
in John 14, 2 through 3, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may also be. I believe his promise. Jesus always keeps his promises. If he promised he is preparing a place and he promised that he would come to receive us, I believe that's a revelation of the rapture of the church. He said that he will take us to his father's house and I believe his promise will be fulfilled. This is what we call the rapture of the church. It was first revealed by, um, in John 14 by our Lord himself. Then it was revealed by Paul the Apostle as the mystery of the body of Christ being caught up to meet the Lord in the air. But there are some who say that the word rapture is not in the Bible. So they therefore argue that the doctrine of the rapture is not biblical. I would also argue that the Bible does not have the word Trinity in it, but we believe in the Trinity. The word providence does not appear in the Bible, but we believe in the providence of God. So the fact that the word rapture does not appear in the Bible does not mean it's not a doctrine found in the Bible. I would also argue that if you were reading from a Latin Vulgate translation of the Bible and came to 1 Thessalonians 4.17, you would find the word raptus or rapture, which means to be caught up or to be taken up by force. So it is a word to express the concept that Jesus is going to snatch us up or we shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and thus we, sh we shall always be with the Lord. Others say that the early church fathers did not believe in or preach or teach the rapture of the church. One of the big arguments commonly heard today against the rapture is that it's a modern doctrine that started with John Darby and the dispensationalists, dispensationalists, and really isn't taught in the Bible and wasn't taught by the church fathers. But it's interesting that if you read all the writings of the church fathers, they write about the imminent return of Christ. They weren't looking for the Antichrist. They weren't looking for the signs of his second coming. They were looking for an imminent return of Christ at any moment. That doctrine of imminency supports the doctrine of the rapture because nothing has to happen before the Lord raptures his church to heaven. So the fact that the early church fathers did not specifically use or teach the term rapture is not necessarily an issue. Remember that the Bible is the authority, not church history. Church history is important to consult, to see the doctrines of the church, but the authority lies in the scriptures, not in the early church fathers, in, not in modern preachers or in church trends throughout history. That's very important to realize. The doctrine of the rapture is described in 1 Corinthians 15 by Paul and in verse 51, it is known as a mystery. Then in Ephesians, he describes what this mystery is. It was something that was hidden in ages past or concealed, but now has been revealed to the people of the New Testament to the people of God. Um, given that truth, I don't believe the rapture is in the Old Testament. It's a New Testament mystery. Also, the church, the body of Christ is referred um, as a great mystery. In Ephesians chapter 5, 32, Paul said, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning of Christ and the church. So the church and the rapture are hidden in the Old Testament, but the rapture is clearly revealed in the New Testament by our Lord and by Paul the Apostle. And um, I'm going to leave you at the end um, of something in the Old Testament that is being revealed to myself and to other watchmen. Um, we're just now starting to see it, 
But if you want to take a look at Zephaniah chapter 2, and we're going to look at Zephaniah chapter 2 in a little bit. And um, I believe there's a reference, a hidden reference to the rapture um, and what we're seeing happening today in the world. But I want to give you several verses about the rapture. It is clearly taught by Jesus in John 14 and by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58. Paul taught in chapter 15 on the resurrection of Christ. And the rapture involves the resurrection of the saints who have died before the Lord returns. And our passage today, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, is the classic passage on the rapture. Also in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 through 21, Paul says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Here, Paul is talking about the Lord coming for the church and the resurrection of the dead and the translation of the living that will take place during the rapture. Now I want to look at five facets of the rapture. Number one is the problem of the rapture, verse 13. Paul says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. This verse gives us the background and the historical setting from which Paul wrote his words. Many verses and paragraphs in the Bible can be understood if you know why they were written, what the circumstances surrounding them were. We know that in chapter 1, Paul wrote a commendation to the believers in Thessalonia. In chapter 2 and 3, through 3, he gave his vindiction, defending himself against the critics who attacked his ministry. And in chapters 4 through 5, Paul is writing instruction or admonition. So from that, we get this direct teaching of Paul in our passage today. Many times, Paul's teaching was based on a problem, a concern, a concern or an issue that had arisen in the church. In this case, it was in Thessalonia. Thus, Paul starts in chapter 4 by admonishing them to walk in sexual purity, then moved to the section saying that they had to be quiet, mind their own business, and get to work. Now in chapter 4, we pick up the issue in which they were concerned about their loved ones who had died. But the rapture hadn't happened yet, so the believers were ignorant about this. In verse 13, there are four key words, ignorant, asleep, sorrow, and hope about the word ignorant. Someone said jokingly that this is the largest Christian denomination in America, the ignorant brethren. There truly is a lot of ignorance in the church when it comes to the doctrine of the rapture of the church. I've seen a decline in understanding of the rapture and especially on the issue that the rapture is distinct from the second coming and the rapture will come before the seven years of the tribulation these teachings have been abandoned by many today. What were the Thessalonian believers ignorant about? What was happening? They had been taught in the few weeks that Paul had been in Thessalonia that Jesus was coming back. They were pumped up and excited about that, so much so that many had quit their jobs and were sponging off of other believers. But some of the believers in the church had died so some friends and family were panicking and were worried about those dead believers when Jesus comes back. They believed those who had died would have a disadvantage compared to those who were alive. They thought their dead believers wouldn't get raptured. They were going to miss out. Basically, they thought that their loved ones who had died in Christ were going to miss out on the rapture. So Paul said, no, no, no. They are going to be resurrected first. He said, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So that was what they were ignorant about. What happens after death? I would say that the most common question I have gotten from Christians is what happens when a believer dies? I don't understand that because the Bible is crystal clear on the issue. 
but there are so many people who are confused on what happens the moment we die. In 2 Corinthians 5.8, it says, To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul here is talking about Christians. When Paul said this, it was early in the church's growth. They were just coming to an understanding of this truth. The moment I leave my physical body, and that's what death is, it's a separation of the soul and spirit. The immaterial part of man from the body then I, as a Christian, am in the presence of the Lord. We go from life to life. We step from this world to the next world, and we will be looking at Jesus face to face. You might title this whole passage face to face with Jesus. We step out of our tent and move into the presence of the Lord. Also in Philippians 1.21, Paul says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So when you die, you're not sleeping spiritually. There's no doctrine of soul sleep here. Um, you, don't have, you don't become a firefly waiting for God to recreate you. You don't cease to exist. You're, you're vitally alive in the presence of the Lord. For to me, to die is gain. Then in verse 23, Paul says, For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. So Paul says that when he departs, he'll be with Christ, which is far better. Everything Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18, is to comfort grieving, sorrowing Christians about their loved ones who had died in Christ. He said, I do not want you to be ignorant about where they are. When someone dies in Christ, you haven't lost them. You know right where they are. They're with Jesus Christ. That's a blessing. I mean, and what a blessing that is. So we don't weep for them. We weep for us who are alive. They're in the presence of the Lord. They don't have to deal with all the problems of this world. So they were ignorant, and Paul wanted to correct that. The second word is asleep. It is used a couple of times in our passage. Paul said, those who have fallen asleep. That could confuse somebody because it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for death. Asleep is referring to their physical death, and it has interesting implications. First, it's only used for Christians. Only Christians in the Bible are referred to as being asleep when they die. Second, it refers only to the physical body. It never re refers to the soul or spirit. The Seventh-day Advents um, believe in the doctrine of soul sleep. They believe that when a Christian dies, he or she just ceases to exist. They go to sleep, and then at the resurrection, they'll be reawakened. So when your loved one dies, they aren't in a conscious state in the presence of the Lord. They're asleep, and they'll be recreated. But souls and spirits don't need to sleep, because they don't have bodies that get tired and need to, need to sleep. Souls and spirits don't need to lay down and take a nap. Uh, Warren Worsby said that he was going to take a vacation and on one of um and one of his congregants complained that the ne the devil never takes a vacation so why was the pastor taking one his retort was that the devil doesn't have a body i do it needs rest so asleep here is referring only to believers it's only referring to the body and the implication this is so important um the, the implication is that their bodies are only sleeping, therefore it's temporary state. They will be awakened. Praise God. The number one passage I like to read is this very verse that we're reading right now. You don't need to sorrow like those who have no hope about those who are sleeping. The word cemetery means resting place. We lay them in their graves resting, waiting for their resurrection. But they are with the Lord. Don't get confused here. Their bodies are sleeping in the graves, but their soul and spirit are in the presence of the Lord. It's called the intermediate state. They haven't gotten their new glorified bodies yet, which they'll get when they're resurrected at the rapture. Now the bodies are sleeping in the dust of the earth, waiting for that resurrection. So it's just a temporary sleep. When someone says they're going to take a nap, you don't start wailing, weeping, and crying, and say, I'm never going to see you again. 
but I know that when some people sleep, they look like they're dead. <sighs> I've um, seen people um, travel once with someone who could immediately go to sleep on his back when his head hit the pillow. You couldn't see him breathing, moving, or groaning. He looked like he was dead. He didn't move or twitch until the alarm went off in the morning. And I thought, that's not fair. Um, but he wasn't dead. He was just sleeping. And when we go to sleep, we all have the expectation that we will arise from our nap. An illustration of this is in John 11. When Jesus found out Lazarus had died, he said, our friend Lazarus sleeps. So the disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So Jesus used the metaphor sleep for Lazarus's death. Jesus knew that in a few hours he would awaken Lazarus from his nap. Jesus would wake him up. When Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus came out of the grave, that was a picture of what will happen at the rapture. Graves will open all over the world, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And this is an exciting truth, um, the resurrection of our bodies. So the Thessalonian um, dead in Christ were only sleeping. The third word is sorrow. Paul doesn't say don't sorrow, but he said you don't need to sorrow as others who have no hope. Your heart is broken. You're sad because of the separation. You've laid your loved one in the grave, but you have hope in the midst of your sorrow. Even Jesus wept at the grave of Lazarus before he raised him from the dead. The fourth word is hope. So the believers start off ignorant. They don't understand sleep. So they are filled with sorrow without hope. But Paul says, no, you have hope. It's not a hopeless sorrow. The believer, even in death, has hope beyond the grave. Now we move from the problem of the rapture to, secondly, the pillars of the rapture, verse 14 through 15. Paul made the statement in verse 13 that they should not sorrow as others who have no hope. Now here's the reason. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. He's referring to the believers who have died in Christ. Every word of these verses is important. We shouldn't be worried about those who have died because they'll be coming back with Jesus to meet us in the clouds at the rapture We'll see them again. Then in verse 15, Paul says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, there are three pillars for the hope of the rapture, for hope beyond the grave. The first one is the death of Christ, verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died. That's the foundation of our hope. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. This verse says, if we believe, but the word if is what is called a first-class condition assuming the fact. So it could be translated, since we believe. Paul wasn't questioning whether they believed that Jesus died on the cross. He was affirming that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Christians believe that Jesus' death was a substitution for our sins, that he came in a body so he could die in my place and in your place. My sins and your sins were placed on Christ, who paid the penalty on the cross, so he was our substitute. He died in our place. His death was a substitutionary um, death, paying the price for mankind's sin. Then notice the second pillar of the believer's hope, the resurrection of Christ. Verse 14, Jesus rose again. You have the death of Christ and you have the resurrection of Christ. Christians believe that Jesus died, was buried, and three days later, he rose from the grave. So why should we fear death? We shouldn't. Jesus took the sting out of death. Jesus died in our place. Jesus conquered sin and the grave and conquered over death. Sometimes people get confused and ask, well, didn't other people get raised from the dead? Yes, but they got raised from the dead back into their mortal bodies only to die again. Jesus rose from the dead like no other person has ever done and hasn't done since. He rose in an immortal, eternal body. So Jesus' resurrection conquered sin, death, and the grave. And the Bible says that Jesus became the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 
Christ is the first in order. Um, Christ is the first in order or the prototype of our resurrection bodies. This is a very blessed truth. Um, and that's that his death and resurrection is the foundation of all of our hope. The third pillar of the believer's hope is the revelation from Christ, verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. This is called biblical revelation. We can't know something unless God reveals it. What lies beyond death is revealed to us as God's word. We don't know about the coming again of the Lord unless he reveals it to us. John 14 would come into play where Jesus reveals that he is coming again. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54, Paul shows us a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Paul wrote that by revelation from the Lord. So the Bible is God's revelation to us. That is very important for us to remember. And this is only for those who are in Christ the church. These three pillars are the foundation of our hope. Now we go from the problem of the rapture and the pillars of the rapture to thirdly, the participants of the rapture. Verse 15, we who are alive and remain, that's the first group. Until the coming of the Lord will by no means proceed. Here's the second group, those who are asleep. These are the two groups that will participate in the rapture, those who are alive and and those who are dead. The Christians who have died aren't going to miss the rapture. They're not going to be at a disadvantage. Those who are living at the time aren't going to miss it. They'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So the first group is those who are alive in Christ. We who are alive and remain, or those who are living at the time of the rapture. Paul says we. So he includes himself in this group. That indicates that Paul believed in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. In 1 Thessalonians 5, um, we'll study the, rev the relationship of the rapture to the tribulation and the end times. We'll see the evidence from the Bible that the rapture happens before the tribulation. So that is why Paul says in chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, but concerning the times, that is the, chrono the chronology and the seasons, that is the characteristics, um, brethren, you have no need that I should write you for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. So those who are alive in Christ will participate in the rapture. That indicates that Paul is looking for Christ's imminent return. Then the second group is those who are asleep. So if a Christian dies before the rapture, their soul and spirit go immediately to be with Christ. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord but their physical bodies will be resurrected at the time of the rapture to be reunited with their soul and spirit. You will see them and know them in heaven. Even if their bodies were cremated um, or have been given a watery grave at their physical death, it's no problem for God. There is nothing too hard for you. If all power belongs to God, it's not reconstruction, it's resurrection. He will raise those bodies from the dead, so don't worry about the dead in Christ. Now the question is, will all Christians living at the time of the rapture be, t be taken? And the answer is yes. Those who have previously died, their soul and spirits are already with the Lord, and they'll come back with the Lord to meet those who are alive in the clouds. It's the bodies of the dead believers that will be resurrected at that time. I don't believe what some believe in that it's called the partial rapture. I don't believe that the rapture is only for super spiritual, deeper life saints. Some preachers say, if you're not really walking with God, if you're not walking in holiness, and you're not really looking up. I literally heard one preacher say that if you're not physically looking up at the time of the rapture, you won't go. And that's not right. 
if you are saved, if you are a Christian, if you have been born again, if you are in Christ, you will go up in the rapture. His righteousness has been imputed to you. Positionally, you are perfectly righteous in Christ. Now, don't misinterpret what I'm saying, that you can go out and live a sinful life and do whatever you want and expect to get raptured. If you have that mentality, then you need to make sure whether you're saved or not. Um, if you're really born again, you won't want to do those things. Jesus changes your heart and your desires. There's been a transformation in your life. So if you want to live in sin, I would have to question your salvation. You're either a saint or you ain't. Um, Jesus is going to take his whole bride or none of the bride. The bride of Christ is going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now we move to the fourth facet of the rapture. We go from the problem to the pillars, to the participants, uh, to the plan of the rapture. Verses 16 through 17. This is where it is broken down into how it will happen. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. I want to break this down into four categories. First is the return. Um, and there are five things about the return. First of all, the Lord himself is coming back. He's not sending a, rep a representative. In Acts 1, two angels appeared when the disciples saw Jesus ascend toward heaven. One of the angels asked them, why do you stand gazing up into the heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Those are some pretty great words. Um, the very same Jesus who we read about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is coming for you. It won't be someone else. It won't be a representative. He's not going to send some angel. He's going to come for us. We are his bride. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, it says that we wait for his son from heaven. The second thing about his return is that he will descend from heaven. John 14, 2 says, in my father's house. He's been there preparing a place and he's back, um, and he's back coming from heaven. The third part of the plan is that there will be a shout. The word shout is the word command. It's a military term. He's going to command us to come up to him. And I think that's fascinating. Um, fourth, there will be the voice of an archangel. We don't know if it's Michael or another archangel. And fifth, there will be the trumpet of God. In those days, they used trumpets to bring people together, to celebrate and to give marching orders. But don't confuse this trumpet of God with the seven trumpet judgments of Revelation or the last trump in the uh, tribulation period. This is a totally distinct and separate trumpet. It's interesting that in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, John said, the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here. And I believe that's when the rapture happens. In Revelation 4, verse 1, when that voice, like a trumpet, says, come up here. Then the second category of the plan of the rapture is the resurrection. We've already mentioned it. Verse 16 says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So the order of the resurrection is that the bodies of the dead saints will be resurrected first. Here it is talking about their physical bodies, their souls, and spirits are already with the Lord, their bodies are going to be resurrected. I heard a true story about the Civil War when the soldiers would be out sleeping in open fields and the snow would come at night and cover them while they slept and you could just see the mounds of their bodies. It looked like a graveyard. In the morning, the trumpet would be blown and one by one the soldiers would arise. What a picture they said that was of the resurrection morning. I never drive by a cemetery where I wouldn't say, hang tight, you're going to be resurrected. You're going to hear the voice of an archangel, the trumpet of God, a command from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. It's so important to understand that they're with the Lord, but their bodies will be resurrected. 
It's pretty marvelous. Um, in Romans 8, 23, Paul speaks about the redemption of our body. You've heard me mention that salvation has three tenses, past, present, and future. The third phase is the resurrection of your body, the glorification of your body. Our bodies have not yet been redeemed. They are degenerating um, quickly. Uh, though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 53 through 55, Paul says, This corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? You talk about hope. You talk about being able to live your life without fear. This is hope beyond the grave. Then the third category of the plan is rapture. Verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. It's the Greek word harpazo. That word literally means to snatch up or to take, take up by force. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, that it will happen in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. As fast as you can blink your eyes or snap your fingers, you'll be changed. You'll be metamorphosed. Um, you'll be glorified. And your body will be redeemed. The fourth category of the rapture is the reunion. Verse 17 It's the phrase together with them. The term them in this phrase is your loved ones, your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters, your aunts, your uncles, friends, children, all who have died trusting in Jesus. You're going to be with them. You'll be together with them. A reunion. The rapture has so many other doctrines that are lined together with it. Um, now you are separated from them, but then you will be together with them. There's going to be a meeting in the air, in the sweet by and by, and all the saints will gather over there in their home beyond the sky, and the music we hear will be glorious to declare. We'll see Jesus, and we'll see our loved ones. We'll embrace each other, be reunited. So don't sorrow as others who have no hope. Jesus died. Jesus rose. Jesus is coming again. This is the blessed hope of the believer, together with them, with our loved ones who have died in Christ. Then in verse 17, we will meet them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. This is not the second coming. In the second coming, Revelation 19, we will be coming back with the Lord to the earth. In the rapture, we will leave the earth and meet him in the air. Then we will be taken right back to the Father's house. So the rapture of the church is a different event than the second coming. Then notice in verse 17, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. We will be face to face with Jesus. The last category is in verse 18, the, prof, um, the prophet of the rapture. So we have the problem of the rapture, the pillars of the rapture, the participants of the rapture, the plan of the rapture, and the prophet of the rapture. There are three things about the prophet of the rapture. It comforts us, it cleanses us, and it compels us. Verse 18 says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. My heart is comforted by these words, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. First, it comforts us to see our loved ones again. There is hope beyond the grave. Secondly, it cleanses us. In 1 John 3, 3, it says, And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he, that is Christ, is pure. The rapture is a purifying hope. He may come today. He may come while I'm sharing this gospel with you. He may come right now. Um, he could come tomorrow. Every time I talk about the rapture, um, I pray that it happens while I'm talking about the rapture, while I'm teaching about the rapture. That would be powerful. Don't be left behind. If the rapture happened now, would you still be sitting there? Would you, would you still be there watching the videos? on your couch, on your phone. 
if not get right with God. Thirdly, it compels us in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, where at the end of the section on the rapture, Paul says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So let's get to work because Jesus is coming soon. You want to know how soon he's coming? What are we seeing today? How soon? How close are we? Look at Israel. The war with Gaza. What's happening over there? Let's look at Zephaniah 2. I mentioned that we were going to take a look at that. And then... Uh, I believe that Zephaniah 2 is prophecy and we're seeing it today. Um, today, right now, it's unfolding in front of our eyes. So Zephaniah 2 says, Gather yourselves together. Gather together, O nation not desired. Does that not sound like the Gentiles? The nation that's not desired, the Gentiles? And we're being told to gather yourselves together. Before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before of the day, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be yet, it may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. And I think that's um, a very subtle description of the rapture in Zephaniah 2, where the world is being told to seek righteousness, seek meekness, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. He's telling us, gather yourselves together, O nation not desired. A great gathering in the clouds. Um, it may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. The day of the Lord's anger sounds to me a lot like the tribulation. Um, the rapture and the tribulation is spoken up right there. Um, and then we continue. What's happening after this? What comes next? For Gaza shall be forsaken. It's not forsaken yet. Gaza is going to be forsaken. Look what's happening. And Ashkelon, a desolation. They shall drive out Ashdod at the noonday, and Ekron shall be rooted up. This hasn't happened yet, but we see what's happening today with the war with Gaza. Very interesting that these things are still to come. Woe unto the inhabitants of the sea coast, the nation of the, and I'm going to butcher a lot of these words, um, the Sherethrites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, the land of the Philistines. I will even destroy thee, that there shall be no inhabitant. And the seacoast shall be dwellings and cottages for shepherds and folds of flocks. And the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed thereupon. In the house of Ashkelon shall they lie down in the evening, for the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. I have heard the reproach of Moab and the revilings of the children of Ammon, whereby they have reproached my people and magnified themselves against their border. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah, even the breeding of nettles and salt pits and a perpetual desolation the residue of my people shall spoil them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. This shall they have for their pride, because they have reproached and magnified themselves against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be terrible unto them, for he will famish all the gods of the earth, and men shall worship him, every one from his place, even all the isles of the heathen. 
ye Ethiopians also, ye shall be slain by my sword. And he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, and will make Nineveh a desolation, and dry like a wilderness. And flocks shall lie down in the midst of her, all the beasts of the nation, both the cormant and the bitter and the bittern shall lodge in the upper lintels of it. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be in the thresholds, for he shall uncover the cedar work. There is the rejoicing city that dwells carelessly, that said in her heart, I am, and there is none beside me. How is she become a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down in? Everyone that passeth by her shall hiss and wag his hand. That's still to come during the tribulation after we've been hidden by the Lord in his father's house, in our father's house. We're going home soon. Um, meditate on Zephaniah 2. Read it for yourselves. Check it out. It seems to be that we're just waiting for Jesus to take us home. And then Gaza's going to be completely destroyed. It's going to be abandoned because who's going to be able to live there? Um, look at look at the footage. We can see it today. This is going to come to pass. And so is Isaiah 17. When Assyria is destroyed, Damascus is going to be destroyed. And I wonder if we're going to see this before we leave. Jeremiah 49. We're on the verge. We're on the cusp of eternity. And we're running out of time to warn you. But we are here as witnesses. And we're sharing what God is showing us. So stop mocking. Stop scoffing. And look at the world around you. Because I want to see you in heaven. 